This talk is part of a series of lectures on um, modular forms and will be about the product formula for the elliptic modular function j. Um, so we just recall that j of tau has a rather complicated um, expansion. If we subtract the constant term 744, it becomes q to the minus 1 plus 196884q plus 2149370q squared plus even bigger numbers. And let's write that as sum of c n q to the n, so I don't have to keep writing out these large numbers. So c1 is 1968.84 and c2 is 2149376.0 and so on. And last lecture we used um, Hecker operators to find some complicated non-linear relations between these coefficients c n. The simplest one we found was 2 c3 plus c1 squared is equal to 2 c4 plus c1. And it was fairly obvious from the way we found this, which came by thinking about the coefficient of q squared in the second Hecker operator, that there were lots of even more complicated generalizations of this. Um, well, there's a neat way to understand all these complicated relations, which is the product formula for the, for the elliptic modular function. This says that j of sigma minus j of tau is equal to p to the minus 1 times product over m greater than 0 and n in z of 1 minus p to the m q to the n to the power of c m n. Here p is equal to e to the 2 pi i sigma and q is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau. Um, and when you first look at this formula, you may think it's, it's obviously wrong because on the left-hand side, we have something that's anti-symmetric in sigma and tau. And on the right-hand side, we have something that doesn't seem to be anti-symmetric at all in p and q. Um, so we better check this first. First of all, you notice that we've got this p to the minus 1. And then we've got a term for n equals minus 1 and m equals 1, which looks like 1 minus p q to the minus 1. And if you write this out, it's just p to the minus 1 minus q to the minus 1, which really is anti-symmetric in p and q. And all the remaining terms are symmetric in p and q. So that's OK. The right-hand side really is anti-symmetric in p and q, although you, you might not think it is. Um, we can write out this... Um, a sort of picture of this product formula. So here I'm going to draw the um, m axis and the n axis. And at each point m n, I'm going to write the number c m n. So it looks like this. Here we've got a c1, c2, c3, c2, c4, c6, c3, c6, c9, and so on in the um, top right quadrant. And the bottom left quadrant looks much the same. And almost all other entries are zero, except we've got a factor of one here and one here, because one is in fact equal to c minus one. So everything else is zero, and all the entries on the axes are going to be zero as well. And what we're taking a product over is um, um, everything to the right of the of, of the vertical axis, and. Um, so, so for each um, point m n, we're taking a factor of 1 minus p to the m q to the n to the c m n, where the p to the m q to the, p and q are sort of indexing m and n in some sense. Um, and the formula we get, j of sigma minus j of tau equals p to the minus 1 times product over m greater than 0 and product over n of 1 minus p to the m q to the n to the CMN is actually very similar to the Weyl denominator formula for a finite dimensional Lie algebra. So the Weyl denominator formula says if you sum over the Weyl group W of some sine which is plus or minus 1 times e to the W of minus rho where rho is something called a Weyl vector this is equal to e to the minus rho times the product over all positive roots of the Lie algebra of 1 minus e to the alpha times the multiplicity of alpha, which you don't usually notice because it's always equal to 1. And if you compare these two, you see they're actually very similar. So on the left-hand side, 
we've got an alternating sum over var group in one case and an alternating sum over a group of order 2 in the other case. So here we should think there's a var group of order, order 2. Um, then we've got a factor of p to the minus 1 or e to the minus rho, which kind of correspond to each other. And finally, we've got this largish infinite product over all vectors that are in some sense positive, so either positive roots or the vectors with, with m positive. Um, in fact, it turns out the product formula for the elliptic modular function really is a sort of part of a generalization of the vial denominator formula. It, it's actually the, uh, the denominator formula for, a, for an infinite dimensional Lie algebra called the monster Lie algebra. And here these coefficients um, C, M, N are actually the multiplicities of roots of the monster Lie algebra. So you can see it's really huge. These, these are very large numbers here. Um, and the monster Lie algebra, as its name suggests, is in fact acted on naturally by the monster simple group. But um, I'm not going to discuss that now. I'm just going to show how to prove this formula using Hecker um, operators. Well, if you look at this formula, it looks absolutely horrendous because First of all, it involves the elliptic modular function, which already has a rather complicated definition and has really complicated coefficients. And then we've got this bizarre double infinite product whose exponents are these incredibly complicated coefficients. Um, however, with Hecker operators, it turns out to be really easy to prove. And we really only need two properties to prove it. First of all, we need to know what the... Um, Hecker operator actually is. In other words, if I've got a, a function sum of c n q to the n and I apply the Hecker operator t m to it, what do we get? Well, I sort of gave a few examples of this last time but didn't quite get round to writing down the explicit formula for the coefficients of the Hecker operator applied to this. And the formula is in fact given by sum over n of q to the n times sum over k divides um, both m and n of 1 over k times c m n over k squared. And the other fact we need to know is that a modular function that's holomorphic on the upper half plane is determined by the coefficients of q to the 0, q to the minus 1, q to the minus 2, and so on. In other words, just the um, powers of q that are less than or equal to 0 in its q expansion. And that, that's because we showed that any modular function that's um, holomorphic at infinity and on the upper half plane is just constant. Um, and using these two facts, we can now prove the product formula for the elliptic modular function as follows. First of all, we take the logarithm of this infinite product. So product over positive m and all n of 1 minus p to the m q to the n to the power of c m n. And um, you know from 1a calculus what the logarithm of 1 plus something is. So we can easily work this out and it turns out to be the sum over all m greater than 0 and n in z of sum over k of c m n times p to the m k q to the n k over k. So that's just coming from the expansion of log of 1 minus x. And we can rearrange this slightly by replacing m k and n k by m and n. So we get this as minus the sum over m greater than 0 and I'm going to separate out the p to the m and we get a sum over um, n in z and a sum over k divides m n of 1 over k times c m n over k squared times q to the n. And now if you were paying attention during the last um, sheet, and if I haven't made any mistakes, you notice that this is just the formula for the, um, the Hecker operator Tm applied to j minus 744. So this sum becomes just minus the sum over all m of p to the m times Tm of j of tau 
minus 744. And all we really care about is that this is some sort of modular function. Um, so um, if we exponentiate this, we find p to the minus 1 times the product over m greater than naught n in z of 1 minus p to the m q to the n times c m n. Um, well, it's going to be p to the minus 1 times the exponential of this. And that's obviously going to be some sort of horrible mess. Um, but we don't really care what this mess is. All we need to do is to say it's the sum over all m of p to the m times a modular function of tau. Because um, here, in this equation, we have a sum of p to the m times a modular function. If we exponentiate this, it's going to be a horrible mess, but all the coefficients of powers of p will still be modular functions. And that turns out to be all we need to know. So, so let's sort of think about what we get. Um, well, let, let, let's try multiplying out this, this massive product, p to the minus 1 times product over m greater than 0 n in z, of 1 minus p to the m q to the n to the c m n. So let's work out what we get. Well, some of the terms are easy to work out. We, we, we get a 1 here, so, so, so this corresponds to p to the minus 1. So, so uh, at the point m n, I'm going to put the coefficient of p to the m times q to the n. So we get a 1 here, and you can see we get a minus 1 here. And the, 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 the terms on, on the m axis are easy to figure out. We just get 0, c1, c2, c3. As you can see, just by multiplying out a small number of terms of this, and everything here is 0, and everything here is 0. And up here we get some sort of hideous mess. Who knows what this is? It's, it's, it's some sort of incredibly complicated product. Um, but fortunately, we don't really need to know what it is because um, these are the coefficients of q to the 0, q to the minus 1, q to the 1, q to the squared. And each of these columns are going to be the coefficients of a modular function. And we can work out what this modular function is just by knowing the terms of q to the 0 and q to the minus 1, which we, which we know. So, so um, here we get a coefficient of p to the minus 1. Here we get a coefficient of p to the 0. And now we want a modular function that is minus 1 times q to the minus 1 plus 0 times q to the 0 plus something. And obviously that's going to be j of of tau. And then we get a c1 times p to the 1 plus and a c2 times p to the 2 and so on because all the functions from here on must be constant functions because all their coefficients of q to the minus 1 vanish. So the sum is very easy. It just turns out to be this, which you can just see as j of tau minus, so it's j of sigma, that should be minus 1 there, j of sigma minus j of tau. So we've magically worked out this uh, in, uh, incredibly complicated looking infinite product just by observing that the coefficient of p to the m for any m is a modular function using Hecker operators, and that allows us to identify it explicitly. Um, OK, so um, next lecture, um, we're going to be looking at Hecker operators applied to modular forms. So, so far in the last two lectures, we've looked at Hecker operators applied to modular functions, which are modular forms of weight zero. And now we're going to look at modular forms of non-zero weight.